And I'm Nathan Baer. I'm a, the public information officer from Temecula Area Highway Patrol. What we're here for today is to give you uh, our legal updates, um, particularly, uh, particularly for the uh, vehicle code. Uh, we have a few government codes and some other stuff. I took out all the stuff that didn't apply to this area. There's, they have special updates for vehicle code sections that apply like up, in, up north, like in the Redwoods for trucks and on different bridges and stuff, but it, it doesn't affect us. It's so, I mean, if anybody's driving a tractor trailer rig that's 60 feet long through the Redwoods and come see me and I'll give you the, the update for that. <laughs> uh, so we'll start with our uh, licensing and uh, this is where we're going to cover license and registration, equipment, and rules of the road, uh, some DUI stuff. The locals only, we took out most of it um, because it applied up north. There's some things that apply in Orange County um, that you may see, so we'll, we'll cover that. Firefighting equipment and licensing, um, they made a f some changes to that. Here's the, uh, what they did is, to save money for the, and time for the local firefighters and departments in the DMV, I guess it used to be where um, if you had your commercial Class A license, you still had to go get your firefighter endorsement. Is that correct? And what they did is they took that out so that um, you already have a full Class A license, you don't have to go get your firefighter endorsement. Um, but that's for the commercial. So you have a guy who was driving big trucks. But also on that, though, is you have to be, if you have that full commercial license and you want to drive the firefighter tank vehicle, your full commercial license has to say tank vehicle. Or if you're driving something that has a double or something like that, then you have to, or a hazmat, you have to have that on your commercial license. But what it does is it adds a restricted Class A license and non-commercial B that will give you that firefighter endorsement. So before you had to get like a Class A and go get the firefighter endorsement, now you have a, a non-commercial Class A, it's a restricted Class A, where you get the firefighting endorsement. Is there any questions on that one? It, it's a change what they, because what they did is they took out uh, firefighting equipment as being uh, listed as a commercial vehicle. So if you look up the section that identifies commercial vehicles, the firefighting equipment isn't in there anymore. So if you have the Class A, you're going to need, if you have the commercial Class A, you're going to have to have that tank or hazmat to drive one of your tank or hazmat vehicles. But if you don't have the Class A, you get the restricted Class A with your firefighting endorsement. Okay. Um, and there's sections that the DMV, it's, it's a little confusing. I, and if you want, I can email you a list of kind of like, if you have this, you need this. But it took out it that being a commercial vehicle. See, this right here is where they took it out. It's not a commercial vehicle anymore. And you look at uh, Section 15278, um, you don't have to have the special endorsements. That's like we used to have commercial endorsements here with the tank vehicle, Class A with the tank. Now you just get the restricted license. And I think that came out of, when we were having all the fires, and they're like, well, we don't have a Class A that can move. We have Class A's, but we don't have enough to move all the equipment. So that's why they said, we'll, we'll do the restricted portion. Back in 1986, they started the Cal ID program. There were surcharges were added to registration fees to pay for that program. Um, we use this in law enforcement. The fire department can use it, too, for their arson and stuff like that. Well, what happened was um, the registration fee that you were paying to help pay for Cal ID was going to sunset on the 1st of January. So what they did is they changed it so that there's a $1 and $2 surcharge that is in your registration fee that's permanent now. And, um, and it can go up by county depending on how much you have to pay for your Cal ID. Now, for people, I don't know uh, if, you, if you live in like in Canyon Lake or in other places like that, or where people have, were putting up these billboards, they're the mobile billboards. Um, they were only, they didn't have a definition for them. So you could park a bicycle with a sign on it, and it wasn't a mobile billboard. Or you could park, you know, like a cart or something. So it was from wheeled to any device or bicycle, includes anything that they put out there that's mobile, like a sled or I don't know where we put a sled at. We don't have any snow. Um, but now the 21100 
allows local ordinances to be adopted for how long they can put that wheeled device out there. Because, I mean, if you put it on a trailer and you put it on a county road, you're, you're looking at um, being able to put it out there for 72 hours before they have to move it if it's a registered vehicle, right? So if you, this will allow, allow people who um, can make it so that you're only allowed to park it there for four hours or eight hours or whatever your, your city or county adopts. But then you'll have to be moved. Now this allows us the V section, the, all the 22651 sections of the vehicle code allow us to store vehicles for unlicensed driving or parked in a lookout too long. They added the section V to allow us to move the mobile billboard advertising device after we've issued a uh, warning citation for the, for the same offense. So I guess if we put a, one of our 422s, that's a warning on there. It's a yellow, little yellow sticker that says you have to move it. If they don't move it, then we can tow it per this section. Where's Caltrans at? You know about downward speed zoning? Um, where uh, truck ramps? Well, this, yeah, it's where they've reduced the speed limit up to five miles an hour for downhills. So um, if you look at it, they needed an uh, engineering and traffic survey. I'll let you read this one. Um, basically, when you look at, they find out what the 85th percentile is up here, the average speed. And then what they do is they establish, Caltrans establishes the speed limit. Like there, they established it at 40 miles an hour. What this bill allows, it, and it's kind of a little bit convoluted, um, but they formulate using <coughs> crashes and how fast people are going to, to get the speed limit. And then there are, that what they're doing is allowing it, um, Caltrans, to lower the speed limit by five miles an hour, which they could before, they could before, um, but you, they didn't, now they don't need the justification. But once you round it down five miles an hour, you can't round it down anymore. Unless you, you, then you have to come up with justification. Before it was, you had, you, you had justification to five miles an hour. Now you don't need justification for it. You can round it down on the downhill to five miles an hour. So it just made it a little easier for, it, for them to change the speed limits. So this is what it looked like, their little, um, the matrix that they used before was right here. What they did is they added, oops, added this in here. So basically what happens is they just were able to round it down without any justification. I don't know, that's, is that exciting for everyone? Okay. Yeah. I, now this one here is, you know, when you have the double yellow lines for your, um, your carpool lane and it's illegal to cross it. Well, some places what they have is, like here's the, the double yellow line. Some places I think in Orange County also have sets of white lines, okay? And people weren't, under, weren't sure, hey, can I cross across? It's not double yellow. So basically what this did is for, uh, it's for high occupancy and toll lanes. See how we have this set of markings? A double white line with these arrows in it. Okay, that means that you cannot cross either. <coughs> unless you're uh, yielding for like an emergency vehicle. Um, or or there, if there's a broken line. But now if you see this here, that means that you cannot, you cannot cross it. This, uh, what you see here, I just found out. Um, they're doing this statewide now. And it's starting in Northern California. So whole state will be uniform with the carpool lane. They've already started up in Northern California and this is what's coming. So this, this does give us, a, this gives us a little space too. Like if you remember, they used to have it out on the 10 freeway by East Los Angeles. It was a, a set of two double yellow lines where you could drive a car or a fire truck or an ambulance right down the middle of them. It was so wide. They took it out to widen, to add more lanes. Okay, this, this does apply to us because we have the off-street parking for electric vehicles in Riverside County. Um, except now, when you have an electric vehicle and you're in an off-street parking lot, it has to be plugged in. Okay, if you're not plugged in um, to refuel your car, then we can, they can be towed so that somebody else can do it. I guess where you see that is like up by UCR, 
off of University. They have the electric vehicle charging stations. Do you have any in Temecula? Do you know? Right. So I think this is going to be, I think we're going to see a, a, another rise in this since we got like the Nissan Leaf and, and some of these cars that are all electric. And um, so they'll probably put them up like maybe at the mall or by the college or something like that. But this allows us to, to remove it if you're not using it. And, and you can't block it. So if somebody puts their Suburban in the electric vehicle stall, then we get to we can remove that too. Now, so, but they have to be charging. Too. They have to be charging. So when you go, I mean, why not? Free fuel, right? Plug it in. It's uh, free. You don't have to pay. I, I'm not even sure. Most uh, places, yeah, they do it as an incentive. Yeah, it's an incentive so that you'll drive your electric vehicle and, and oh, buy one. Yeah. Right, you just plug it in. This, the ones up by UCR are free. Also, yeah. What they're saying here is even if you have an electric vehicle, you can't just park it there. It has to be charged. Yeah. So and I don't see why you wouldn't, anyways. I mean, if you drove it there, you used energy, so you top it, top it off. We have a parking rights, and it's free. Parking rights. Yeah. Oh, hmm. yeah. well, you can pay if you want. <laughs> you can just send Caltrans a check, right? Yeah. Uh, this could apply to some people in here for their construction vehicles. You're required to have backup alarms now and everything. Most people already do. I guess city and counties always put it in there. They don't want to run somebody over. Um, but they're required on all dump trucks now, all uh, garbage trucks, and also anything that's over 14,000 uh, gross vehicle weight rating. Um, and it has to be heard from 200 feet. Does that apply to anybody in here? But most people already have backup alarms, right? Yeah. So this is what, a, a, what they define it as. If you're uh, you know, hauling a double or something with aggregate, any type of cement, transfer trucks, bottom dumps, end dumps, any type. So all dump trucks are requiring it now also. Okay, this is probably one where people are a little confused at, and this is probably the big law for this year that's going to affect most people. It's your child uh, restraint. Now, um, what it says is your child has to be in a child safety restraint until they're eight years old, or um, four foot nine, uh, eight years old. No pounds. No pounds anymore. Well, they removed the weight because I, you know you have the childhood obesity and stuff like that. So you're getting three-year-olds that were, you know, getting close to 60 pounds. So, uh, still, those three-year-olds should be you know, proper testing. Right, that's why we took it out. Because, I mean, I made a stop up here in late, you know, on uh, the 74, and there was like a four-year-old kid in the front seat, but he weighed like 65 pounds, but, you know, the, the strap is going across their face. So um, I think it was just because we have a, a little bit pudgier kids now and uh, we're, we need to still restrain them. So basically, um, so how do you make a belt do that or do you have to have a special seat? Well, if you're, if you're under eight, then what you'd use is a belt positioning booster seat. You know, like uh, this isn't one. Let me see if I have a picture of one in here. But, it, but to well, look at it. It's 11 that they were supposed to not be in the front seat. Well, there's, there's, to eight? there's um, recommendations. Like if you watch, like Disney says, don't let a child sit in the front seat till they're 13, right? right. Um, or 11. But basically what it is is sizing. I mean, if you have an 8-year-old that's out of their car seat and they're sitting in the front seat and they have to wear the, the seatbelt under their arm because it, it will go across their face, um, then that's a citable offense because they're not wearing it properly. But I don't understand why they lowered well, it w there's no there's no law on age for for sitting in the front seat. There, it's a recommendation, but there's no law on it, right? Well, you can if you're if you're eight years old, you can sit in the front seat. If you're under eight, you can't, because there used to be no law on age for the front seat if you were out of your child seat, because it was six years or sixty pounds. So if I hit seven years old, I could sit in the front seat without any type of booster or anything like that. Well, it's not enough. That needs to be 
Yeah, and I, I can probably see that it will come. I think, I think it will. We're, um, I think there was 30 other states ahead of us in this law um, that, that changed. So um, a lot of people got, got to be reach six years old and the parents or whatever took their car seats and threw them away. And then the law came out, and now you're eight. And so we're, putting, we're seeing a lot of kids we're putting back into car seats. And, and, uh, but most of them are going into booster seats, and it positions the belt properly. Yes, ma'am. Well, a lot of the ambulances I see, they transport them in their car seats. They are exempt. Yeah, they're exempt. It says emergency vehicles. Only specifying the front seat. So if you're in the front seat of a taxi, you have to be eight or older and in a or in right. a restraint. But if you're in the back seat of a taxi cab, you're exempt because of the nature of the well, taxi cab. No, At least that's no, the that, that, that. that's that's what it says. But if you're in the back seat of a taxi and you're six years old, you need a child seat. Okay. That that might be a little confusing. Um, it still applies. Um, okay, and so it's. Eight or eight or they say four, four foot four, four foot, foot nine. Four foot nine. But I don't know any four foot nine eight year olds. So um, really, the more important, even as a parent, we're probably better off waiting until four foot nine as opposed to eight because the restraint is more important. Well, it depends. It depends on how your seatbelt fits. Okay. If you're because some seats, if you look at like a Volkswagen Jetta, the back seats are maybe sm they're shorter. And they angle up a little bit because you want to be able to fit an adult in the back. So the seats are a little shorter. Now let's say you have like our Crown Victoria, the seats are wider. So if you get a, an eight-year-old sitting in there, maybe their legs are sticking straight out, you know, because they can't bend over the seat, which will cause hip and, hip and leg injuries if they get in an accident. Okay. So, so really focus on the prop being properly restrained. Properly restrained. If you're eight years old, if you're eight or older, you don't need a child seat now. It used to be six years old and 60 pounds, now it's eight. But what they did is the four foot nine, uh, they say is because when you four foot nine, I mean, we have adults that are four foot nine and they don't need a child seat, right? Because the seat belts will fit them. Although seat belts are designed for adult males, really. If you look here, um, change the from six to eight and it deleted the reference of weight because we were having kids that were four years old and 65 pounds and you know, have a seatbelt across their face. If anybody's unclear with this one, um, we, can, we can continue uh, with the questions. Just real quickly, um, can you change the seatbelt to be, you know, because I've seen these little, even for us adults who sometimes get the seatbelt like this, because we're not particularly tall. Right. Uh, you can get a little plastic thing, if you will, to pull the one closer to the other so it hits you. Like, like the clip? Yeah, like the I clip. think for a, a kid, I wouldn't use that. Are those What's legal or illegal? No, I don't think it's so. Not a, it's not a legal rep, uh, it's yeah. not a legal thing to do. A lot of people do it, but it's not. You, you have to wear the seatbelt in the manner in which it was designed. Okay, now that uh, because auto manufacturers have gotten a little more creative, they have the sliding portion up here. If you're adding stuff here for comfort, um, no, I would say no, because you're changing what the factory just intended for it. Um, but eight years old um, is the big thing. This is a, a belt positioning high back booster seat and has like the head, the head stuff. I would prefer kids to be in this. Now they have actually um, the latch system that secures this high, high back uh, booster seat to the seat because you you know you put a kid in the booster seat and it feels like they're kind of wobbling all over the place or if you get one of those it's just a half a seat and you set it in there and it seems like it's always falling out I think that the manufacturers will actually because of this law start changing the way they secure the seats too uh, we do see the seats now like this one that have uh, little latches that will come off of here and hook to your latch in your car that way the seat is secure it just seems really loose to me, I you know. know like my dad put my car, my daughter's car seat in, and I'm like, this is nuts. And I, I guess that's how you guys used to do it years ago. But yeah, I know mine is as solid as you can get it in there with the latching system. And I don't know why you wouldn't want that extra. Right. It, well, and see, the booster seats, they don't always come with latches. Yeah. They're just a piece of, it's like, well, it's designed to position the belt. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, 
it's kind of similar to sitting on a phone book, right? It's just lifting you. Yeah. Up, it's just lifting you up higher. Mm -hmm. Of course, a phone book is is not crash. You know, they don't test it in a crash. But this, they you know, this they do. But I mean, I'm with you on that. It, yeah, something like that. And then you have to worry about your, your weights, too, on, on some of these booster seats. Some go to 65 pounds. Some go to, you know, 95 pounds. But you can find, like, Recaro. They make a, a seat. You know, they make racing seats for cars. They make a car seat that has um, the shoulder straps that go up to 95 pounds. So you can put, like, a seventh grader in there, right? Um, so they have a five-point harness, which is the safest for children. And so the booster seats have gotten bigger, so you can go up to, I think Britex has one also that goes up to 95 pounds. So those are... We have actually seen kids in car seats like this with the belt hanging up top, not even wrapped around the car seat. So the kid's sitting in the car seat, but it's not secured to anything. Yeah. So it, you kind of do a double take on the stuff. You know, mom's up there. And your seatbelt's not wrapped around the car seat. Yeah, so it becomes an eject, oh, well, ejector he seat. She unlatches it. Yeah. Uh, we, we do. Um, do you give them a ticket for that? Oh, oh yes, it's it's very expensive, and it's a point on your driving record. Um, we do car seats every Friday at our office, um, and every once in a while we'll do an event. Our last event was at Bye Bye Baby. Um, we did, I think, forty installations or inspections. And the only seats that we saw that came in that were correctly installed were ones that we had installed before. Mm -hmm. Like they, we installed them, helped the parents install them as a newborn, and then they were coming to upgrade to a larger seat. And we said, well, who installed this? Because it's like, correct. And they said, oh, you guys did at some other event. I said, oh, okay. But most of them are installed improperly. I mean, I guess they say 75% are installed improperly. But at our office, we get like probably like 95% or more. Which is scary because it's so much easier. It's just click, 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 and push down, pull. Yeah, and it depends on your seat, too. If you get an expensive... Yeah, it depends on... There's a, some cars don't have latch systems. Some cars have weird seats, uh, like the back of some of the Lexuses, uh, the SUVs. Their middle seat is shaped funny because it's kind of a split. So trying to get them in there is... I mean, it'll take you like 30 or 40 minutes when you know what you're doing. And when you don't know what you're doing, it just becomes frustrating. Um, and then when you're reading the manual, it's like, okay, because you need to read your owner's manual. You need to read your car seat manual, uh, both of them together to find out how to install it properly. So I'm... What gets difficult is when you have grandchildren visit from out of state. Right. You know, they fly in. You're not prepared. Right. So having to do, I have to buy a box car seat. But then the other question comes to mind, let's say... The children from another state drive into California with whatever is appropriate for their state. Do they have the potential of being ticketed? Yes. So anyone coming into California needs to know this. Right. And, and another, another thing about that, say they fly into Orange County and they pick up a rental car and they have a five-year-old, what is the rental car uh, company required to do? Provide a car seat. They're going to charge you for it, but they have to make car seats available. A lot of people don't know that. So can they even let you if you rent from Avis, they have to have car seats there. Right. And, and, and it happened to me once when we got our, our luggage or what, and all our stuff got shipped and we didn't get on the plane because of a mix-up. or and So our stuff, we had to rent a car somewhere else, and we got a car seat from them. Um, but they're not always the nicest car seats. And, I mean, you could probably get a car seat for like 45 bucks nowadays. So sometimes $45 versus 400 for your citation. Is that how much the citation is? Oh, yes. Wow. Oh, yeah. I, I saw, I went to court a, a month or so ago, and I, uh, I had written two child restraint violations and a speed, the guy was doing like 95 miles an hour, and he had two children that were sharing seat belts with adults. The fine on that was $1,400. I mean, I've seen them higher. I wrote one ticket for like five child restraint violations and all this stuff that was going on. And the, the citation was $3,800. I mean, a DUI is $1,500. I mean, just for the fine, not for your restitution and everything. Was that? Oh, that was five points. Five? Yeah, five points on the driving record. I mean, she lost her license like that because you're four points in one year and you lose your driver's license, right? Oh. 
Yeah. Uh, they knew they knew it was unsafe, but people decide, well, we want to go down to San Diego from L.A. to visit our grandmother. We only ha we only want to take one car. We have six adults and four kids, yeah. so we'll just share. Yeah, and we used to do, uh, I mean, I, you know, I used to drive around with people in the back of my pickup truck bed, you know, from high school, like yeah. a week after I got my license. Yeah. But it's, uh, you know, yeah. it's a like different time. We have a little more craziness going on out there, a lot more cars, and a lot faster speeds, you know. You don't see the speeds back then that you do now. So uh, if they're under eight and they're, uh, and they're four foot nine, they may be restrained in a seat belt, okay, rather than a, and that's because they'll fit, they'll fit into a, a seat. And you'll see some tall kids like that, you know, usually coaches grabbing them for the basketball team. So if there's no, no rear seat, I mean, the only other place you can sit is the front seat. Uh, if you have those side-facing jump seats, uh, which would cause kind of a hard impact on the body, different, I mean, side impacts, I guess, are a lot more, more injuries than the you know the frontals uh, the way your body shaped it's not designed to bend sideways in half so um, if you have that you can install your uh, child safety seat in the front seat but you have to make sure that you turn off the airbag or if you have rear facing uh, rear seats I guess like, like the old station wagon where the very back seat has a has a facing out to the back or if we can't get it installed in the back seat, maybe you have like a sports car, they put a back seat in there just for insurance purposes, you know, and we can't get this car seat in there, then we put it in the front. Or if all your rear seats are already occupied under, for children under seven. So if you have like a one, two, three, four, or five, you know, five year old like that, then we'll have to put, you know, one of them in the front seat. Or if there's medical reasons, and we have special seats for that. There's children that have like harnesses that they wear that's secure rather than a seat. But it's for um, children with special medical needs. First offense is a hundred bucks, but that's the fine that is the the bottom line mandated fine. When you got your county uh, or your court assessments, that's three hundred and sixty bucks, four hundred bucks. So your second one. 250 plus the, all those assessments, so you're like five or six hundred dollars, right? Uh, special provisions for the economically disadvantaged, they can go to, um, we have some car seat um, classes that they, they have to attend like these classes, and then when they, they get done, they have a chance to buy a cheaper car seat, and then they won't get all the huge fine. But you're still going to get points on your driving record because it's one point for the, any, anybody under 16 that's not restrained is going to be a point. So if you're driving around with a 14-year-old year in, year in their car, they're not restrained, then that's a, a point on your driving record. And that's also pretty expensive. So if you had, oh, go ahead. Right, you do. But I'm saying um, if you're under 16, the ticket goes to, you're a child. Uh, and in the eyes of that law, sorry, I didn't explain it right. So what happens is they give you a point on your driving record, um, but if you're over 16, then the ticket goes to the 16-year-old. Right, right. But if you have a 16-year-old riding in your car, you can cite the driver for allowing the 16-year-old not to be belted. I, I was going to say, I was under the impression that it was going to be a, we both got tickets, not a, they got tickets. Yeah, I mean, it can go either way. I mean, if, if, it's, a, if it's an adult, Generally, I mean, I cite the guy who doesn't have the seatbelt on. If it's a kid, you could, you know, you want to make sure mom and dad buckle up the 16-year-old, um, then you'll, you can go that route. Is there any questions on the restraints or the seatbelts? It's, it's just pretty much made it, the kid's older, so we have more time in a car seat, which is a little healthier, a little safer. So this, um, everybody heard about, did everybody hear about what happened at sobriety checkpoints, what we were doing? We were setting up our sobriety checkpoints or and sobriety slash driver license checkpoints. People were driving in. If they didn't have a license, we were able to impound their car for 30 days. Uh, this came out of uh, Gil Cedillo, and this is mainly stemmed out of Los Angeles. Uh, so when we, we, they come up there, 
we were making, they were making more license impounds than they were arresting drunk drivers. Because a drunk driver sees a DOI checkpoint and you know, hangs a UE or something. Um, but we're having people with no driver's license come in. And what happened was, is it came uh, out of the large migrant like worker population that they have in Los Angeles. And so when they were driving in without a license, they were snatching, the, taking their cars for 30 days. And uh, what they were thinking, what came out of this is go, well, how are they supposed to, that will, they won't be able to get their car back because it'll be about an $1,800 impound fee. Um, and then they said it was causing a financial impact on them too much. And that if they lost their car, then they couldn't drive to work, which I don't, I don't get. But that was what was behind it. So if you don't have a license and you go in there, uh, we couldn't take it for 30 days uh, because we want you to, they wanted you to be able to drive illegally to work the next day. So, so, I, just at the GUI sobriety checkpoints. Now, if you do a vehicle code violation and we stop you for it, then we can still impound the car for 30 days. And they're, ha they're fighting that. The Charlie Beck, Chief Charlie Beck in Los Angeles was trying to restrict that from his department saying, no, we, we're not going to do it anymore. But he caught, he's catching huge amounts of heat over that. And they were actually checking on if that was uh, going to be lawful for him to do that. Because we do have a vehicle code section that allows us to impound the car for 30 days. Yeah. So they're not allowing the sobriety checkpoint slash vehicle inspection. Like we would pull in cars for vehicle inspections that for the Bureau of Automotive Repair. So Highway Patrol is authorized to work with the Bureau of Automotive Repair to bring them in. So now what they're doing is, uh, it's not a vehicle inspection sobriety checkpoint, but I don't know of anybody who was doing that. We're, they were doing more license and sobriety checkpoints. Um, so a dumb question, if you just, if you have a driver's license checkpoint and happen to bust them for DUI. Does that work? I mean, yeah. to, to me, it's, it just will reverse it then, because it's more important to check for license anyway, and you'll happen to catch the drunk drivers right. anyway. And they can still do that, um, and that's fine. Um, this says that they're required to stop. I mean, I think they're pretty much required to stop anyways, but they had to put it more in writing. And now when we do that, we have to allow the driver of the unlicensed driver to get somebody there during the checkpoint um, to drive the car away that has a license. If they don't, if they can't do it, then we can impound the car for uh, what they call a P storage or for one day until the next day when they can bring a licensed driver to the office to get their car. And, and then we also have new release procedures. Right here, like I said, if, it, if they're 12500 is unlicensed driving. Yes, sir? When you impound a vehicle, Yes. Correct, and I mean that can range up to like three hundred bucks, something like that. I mean, depending on the tow fee, but it's it's close to that, um, two hundred fifty, something like that, because of one night of storage. I mean, it costs almost as much to stay in a hotel or like Motel Six it does to store your car in the in the lot. It's like fifty bucks a night or something. So what it says here is for 12500 is unlicensed driving. That's not suspended license. Um, there's no 30-day impounds. That's just if you're unlicensed, like you don't have a license. Uh, but suspended license would be different, right? If you have a suspended license, then we can still, still take it. Uh, we have to try to find the registered owner of the car or a licensed driver. And then... Um, if not, then we can impound it for that day. Now, when we issue the unlicensed driving ticket, we're, the officer's required to write the name, and I, I, I don't know if this is just for highway patrol, um, but we have to write the name and the driver's license number of the person that took, the, took it away. They get fined in some part if somebody drive their car that's unlicensed? Yes, you can cite, you can cite people for that. And I've cited people for that, allowing an unlicensed driver to drive. Yes. That gets kind of tricky, though, because you need to prove knowledge to move. Right. The person was unlicensed. So you, if we, you can interview them. So we took the car the other night. Um, the driver was DUI. It's his seventh DUI in, in like six years. He was suspended 
time and time again through DMV, and he's driving a $71,000 Cadillac, which is his mom's car. Okay. So we took it for 30 days because he's suspended. What do you think mom's going to do today, actually, since it was a long weekend? She's going to try to get her car out. You think she knew that her son was suspended? He, he probably does after seven DUIs, that's usually what you find. They live with mom. Seven DUIs, right. Well, a 30-day impound for a vehicle, we call it going to car jail. Uh, it's upwards of $1,800 for 30 days. It's not, uh, fines imposed to the tow company. Yeah. So you get a lot of these cars that you impound like in, in lo a little bit lower economic areas. They don't get their car back because they'll just wait until the tow yard has a, a lien sale and they'll go buy the car for a new car for a thousand bucks or five hundred bucks and and start do it again and they'll run it until they get caught and we'll impound it and then they'll go buy another five hundred dollar car and we'll impound it that's how pick apart gets full you know because we take all the junky cars like a lot of these kids are driving on suspended license their parents know they're still out running around with their buddies uh, Nine times out of ten, when they come into our office for a tow hearing, they're not going to get their car back. Even though it's registered to mom's name or dad's name, we're going to hold that car for 30 days. Does it, everybody agree with that? Well, at least get a little there, are, there are some hardship cases well, uh, that will release the car within five or ten days inside of the 30-day holding period. But they really have to show a hardship. I work two jobs. This is my only car. Yet, you know, they have to come in with some ammunition to get their car back. But for the most part, yeah, we'll, we'll deny the release and hold it for 30 days. Is this, it could go either two ways. It will either increase the population at, at car holding places um, to a point of bizarreness, or it will reduce the number of people, unlicensed drivers. Of course, the object is to reduce the unlicensed drivers. So it's either a boon for the economy? Well, I, I don't think I've, in, in this area, you have a, a lot lower unlicensed driving population compared to when I worked in San Bernardino where I could go make 10 stops and get 10 unlicensed drivers, you know, in a row if, if I worked at it, you know. Um, but down here, it, it's more, you'll find more suspended drivers for DUI or something like that than you will just no license at all. But um, basically, I mean, this section for the sobriety checkpoints says that if we do impound it, we have to release it when the tow facility is open and the driver comes in with, with the license and proof of registration. Now, this, this uh, goes for the wet reckless. Like, people are getting maybe they, they were driving poorly in their DUI, but maybe we got a, a low blood on them. We were maybe 08, 09 at the scene. Our chemical test is a 07, so they're not technically over the 0.08% the level. And then what they'll do is plead them out to a wet reckless. It's a lesser DUI charge. Uh, it suspends their license. And um, right here, um, before I think it was the, ret the, ret the wet reckless was more severe suspension than a full DUI charge. But I think they do that too because uh, people um, think, oh, okay, I kind of got away with it all. I can still go. I didn't get a DUI. But now um, when you get the, the reckless driving, you get a 90-day sus suspension. Um, you can't have more than two priors in 10 years. Kind of seems like a lot if you keep getting wet reckless after wet reckless because basically it was a good solid DUI that they pled out because of maybe you were, your blood alcohol dropped before you got your, your test. You have to enroll in a DUI program, um, and you have to put an interlock device on your car. So that's new. Anybody seen these? I, I saw a lady do that the other day. I was laughing. <laughs> but I wonder what you have to do to get that. Get, yeah, yeah, get it. I'm, get sure, it I'm sure she'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> she may, it may give you a hand signal of what she did. So the car won't start until that thing. Right. So, and, and if you get caught driving a vehicle without an interlock device, it's, uh, it's citable. It's, and it's expensive fine. 
Or if you have somebody else blow into it, and you, let's say you have been drinking, and you're not DUI, but you have your kid blow into it, that's a, against the law, too. So, uh, Just because I'm curious, how much does one of those cost? Yeah, you know what? I, I don't know. But you have to have it installed, and then it's maintained monthly, too. So there's a fee for that. I don't think it's too cost prohibited um, because they want people to still be able to drive, but do it more safely. Okay, this, this goes here, I don't know, if, for like if you get on Metrolink and stuff like that, um, they're, t they're making it instead of criminal, they're making it civil. So whereas you used to be able to go to like San Bernardino Court, um, we had the, uh, the Metrolink that would come into court and do the toll evasions in front of, at the traffic court. Now they're making it civil and the penalties are, are they have to be collected by them also. So here's now the fines are up to 250 for in violating those uh, tolls and community service. But that's if, uh, if we enact this, we're going to have to do reports on it to see if it's working. But like if you, there's like all kinds of different things you can do on a transit bus that's wrong, like spitting, you can't spit, or curse, or stuff like that. Now this, um, they, this law came out because they want to put more advertising on buses. I know this one's kind of, I mean, we'll probably see it down here. <laughs> they do have that in Santa Monica right now. Has anybody seen them down here anywhere? Illuminated bus uh, displays? Las Vegas, yeah. Santa Monica starts off, they have 25 buses that are going to be able to have it. You can't have like red lights here um, that emit red, anything that looks like an emergency vehicle. <laughs> And here's, here's what's going to be the restrictions. But when you're, when you're driving, like on freeways and stuff like that, you can't rotate the signs. So people can't read, you know, oh, there's SeaWorld, there's, you know, Burger King, stuff like that. So they're going to see how it works up until 2017. And then they'll be able to add um, some more buses after 2014, and then they'll do a report we had to come up with a standard for the LED lightings. So this is a, a, some more of that. Jeffries, who's right over here. Actually, this is Riverside. Yeah, this is Riverside. Um, basically, they're adopting uh, new plans. They have to meet federal safety requirements. Um, and then they're coming up with traffic lanes for them. So if you have the smaller ones that are more like golf carts, they need their own lane, right? Here's the uh, one that's a little faster. They can go on a little higher roadway, but they need their own lane. And then here we have where we can use them on streets up to 35 miles per hour. And that's what we have now. Uh, where what we had was you could drive your golf cart around. You know, you see in Sun City, they have a license plate and stuff like that. If they're under, you know, 35 mile an hour roadways, they can drive. That's fine. But um, I think what, we're, what they're going to work on is putting these lanes in next to places because people were like, well, I can go from here almost to Stater Brothers, but when I crossed onto this street, the roadway went up to 40 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So they, Around UCR, they actually worked to reduce the speed limits around right. the campus to permit the use of um, or the golf carts. Right, so you'd have to lower it to 35 so that people could use it, but now they're going to make a lane for you so that you can go you know, in your golf cart and then hopefully won't get ran over by a big rig or something on, on a 55 mile an hour roadway. Okay, this is out for Orange County and they have programs out there already, but they're gonna, they, it was gonna end next year for their electric vehicle programs, but it's gonna just continue to, to uh, 2017. And it's like these little vehicles right here. You know, they're not as fast, um, but if you live in a community where you don't have to drive far, I mean, that's a great idea is you plug in your golf cart and has the windshield and all and you can drive down the Stater Brothers or to the community center or, or wherever you need to go. Now you can, this, the bill before that we just spoke of is going to let you get more places. But they're going to have to, it's going to cost more money. The charging stations that you mentioned earlier, I don't think they have 120 volts on that, do they? It's 
for the uh, for like the golf carts with the smaller plug. Right. Yeah. Because they don't have a 110. Uh, then, then all you do is not park in an electrical vehicle spot, just park in a regular spot. But, um, and see, that would be, and that's out of our control, what, what they put on there. I don't know if they can have maybe a, a charging station that has the higher voltage and the 110. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but most of them are bigger. I think it's a 220. Yeah, 220 is what they plug into most of the vehicles. Or you have to have some type of adapter. Because they, they do that. I think they have an adapter for the leaf or whatever if they don't have 220. Um, but yeah, you... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to do anything that's not legal. So these, I guess you just kind of... Out of luck, unless you can let the grocery store run you an extension cord, you know. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Tiny cars like that, I've seen them out on the big highways. Well, they they might look like a like a smart car or something like that, but those are you know gas powered, so they'll have, and they you know they use different roll cage technology and stuff like that. But they do have tiny cars out there. They're just these are powered by like you know six car batteries or something like that. Okay, I gotta ask a stupid question about the, uh, the smart cars. I've been told that in a place where you would normally parallel park, you can pull a smart car in straight because it doesn't exceed the distance from the curb that would no normally be required for parallel parking. No. Is that the case? No, it's not the case because you have to park both right side tires 18 inches from the curb. Okay. So that's what would happen, unless, I don't know, maybe, you'd have to get a really smart car to get both right sides. <laughs> Tires. You'd have to stand up on that. That's called a Segway. I have seen a smart yeah. car parked in front of a fire hydrant and four officers lifted it and moved it 12 feet. So. Did they really? Oh, yeah. yeah okay. You get four or six guys on it, you can actually lift them up. And I, I, I just want to kick it out of the way. That's <laughs> you know, but. Okay. Um, oh, let me go back. They're talking about event action plans, and this may... Um, have to, uh, you, you'd probably know for fire, do you guys, they have to do that for the city of Temecula or something like that if they're going to have a big concert or something like yeah, that? Yeah. yeah, so they do that anyways, but now they're required because if you look at here, we had this, uh, the raves that they were having out in LA, and you know, they had one man die at this one, 18 hospitalizations, two people die at this rave, you know, Drug arrest. Look at the attendance, though. 45,000, 16,000. Uh, that one that they had, the three-day rave, where they had all those people get hot. 120 people got hospitalized because of the, like, the bad ecstasy they were taking. One girl died. There's 185,000 people that attended, though. So this added the requirement that there be a threat assessment uh, for a public event you know, on state-owned or leased property. So they, if you have 10,000 more people, it has to be a re reviewed and approved by a state agency. And they may charge a fee for preparing an action plan for them. So. You can actually, I'm old, so you can actually have a big party and invite all those people and give them all drugs legally? No, you can't give them the drug part legally. <laughs> well, they bring, yeah, they, yeah B BYOD. <laughs> yeah, bring, bring your own, own drugs. Yeah, they're going to dance, and some, some of them will do drugs, but that's... And, but not everybody. It's not like packed out. Uh, I don't know. I've never been, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, Woodstock. That is an interesting question, though, is do, do those action plans generally require uh, drug mitigation plans, and how do you respond to those types of incidents? Well, they're going to now, because they have to prepare, prepare for the threat assessment for everything. Yeah. So they'll look up... It has the see what kind of law enforcement they need that would go into your drugs. Uh, the medical concerns, if it's the city, of, city fire or who's gonna be out there with the ambulances. And here, the drug use and distribution, which is gonna happen at a rave party. Somebody's bringing in hundreds of ecstasy pills. So what are we gonna do to keep the drug use down? 
And we have to look at their prior history, if they had good promotions, if they had no deaths and stuff like that also. They, I think they operate on something different. That's for the state, state owned or leased property. Oh, so if it's a county owned property, they don't have to. Like, I, I think. At the county level, and the city actually didn't like it. Where they had submitted an international plan. Right. Of well, I guess the county m can make up their own uh, legislation on that, their own rules. So that's just for state. Yeah, that was for, just for state property. Would that apply to football games as well as I don't. I think they have a little bit different action plan for that because it's not the party and they're not expecting the drugs and the, and the, and the ecstasy and stuff like that. That's a different it, But it, there is an action plan that, oh, that LAPD has done. Because LAPD has their own threat assessments on the Coliseum and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, that's on county property, right? Yeah, they, they have one already, and this is just, I think, for the state saying we have to have. We see, we've seen what happens on county property, and we're going to make this uh, ha mandatory on state property. They already had it, though. We do out there, we, we coordinate with law, fire, right. Uh, the yeah, and, and I think it, they do it anyways, but this just makes sure that they do it. Taxi cab pull, uh, this is just for taxi. Before they couldn't um, just, they didn't really have the way to really pull um, driver's license reports. So this makes it, is going to make it easier for the taxi cabs to pull their driver's license records. So you have taxis that operate in Murrieta and Temecula. The companies now can just pull the, the licensing uh, and see if their guys are still licensed. So that's just real quick there. There is some mandatory requirements, um, but you know his fourth DUI will be a felony, fifth will be a felony, sixth will be a felony, seventh will be a felony. So maybe he gets uh, four years or something like that, and he maybe does half or whatever, depending on time served and this and that, or what kind of deal he makes. It's just, I guess it would just have to be tougher laws requiring mandatory sentences. Because basically, when we take him off the streets and put him in jail, we're just trying to find it. It's not really rehabilitating him from drinking. It's putting him someplace so that he doesn't drive drunk for a while. You know, um, there should be, that would have to be some type of another assembly bill that says, okay, if you get number six, mandatory this many years. They do have mandatories, though. Um, right. Yeah, it depends if there's like the. Was that the one in Bill Ranch? Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and then you have to look at their prior, you know, what if they had, because there's like that mur murder rule, like the felony murder rule and stuff like that that would apply. Yeah, and, and they're driving illegally. So, I mean, we catch them and pound their car for 30 days and put them in jail. But, I mean, besides that, it, then it goes to the district attorneys and they have to work the stuff out there with what they have given to them by law. It's frustrating for us because our job is to get them off the road and then they go into the court system and then we back out. It's all up to the DAs and the public defenders to hash things out. But our job is to get them off the road so they don't kill themselves or somebody else. But yeah. it, it is frustrating at times to see some of the sentences handed down. I mean if you have but seven DUIs you wouldn't, you wouldn't you wouldn't so expect like them to be out there. Exactly. I mean but how many years do you give somebody with an alcohol problem? Mm. You know, they're, they're calling it a disease. So um, do you put somebody in, in jail for 20 years because of what and they're doing? Alcohol is medically classified as a drug, so now they have a drug problem. So, yeah. You think drug, you don't think alcohol, you think drugs. I mean, but if he was to go and kill someone next, then there would be a very, very long sentence. Because he knows... Because uh, when you get sentenced for DUI, they tell you 
hey, you know that this is dangerous, this, that you could kill somebody. They, they tell you that. And they warn you, if you kill somebody after this, then you're going to face harsher penalties. And they, they tell you that in the courtroom. So they, it's on record that you know that it's dangerous to drive drunk. So back to the taxi cabs. Um, they don't have to participate in this program. They can if they want. Um, they just, during uh, regular business hours, they can pull the driving record. Let's see if we wanted to go through these. Oh yeah, if we, if we find somebody that's driving with a taxi cab suspended license, we, can, we impound the car, but we have to release it to the, uh, the people that uh, own it. Let's see, I guess we took out disabled person's parking stall or space out of this law. I don't even know <laughs> what it said before, so you have to forgive me. Uh, for this is uh, our, when we are uh, taking a car for registration, the legal owner, like let's say the bank, doesn't have to update the registration to get the car back. Okay, they're going to, but they don't want it to sit there for an extra week accruing fees of, because they're going to repossess it. Does everybody understand that one? So re, re, uh, we, we take cars all the time, and then the legal owner, the bank, will come and say, hey, I want it, and we'll get, we have to give it to them. So this is, lets them do that too. Okay, <laughs> I like this one though. Public transit buses have to have a working speedometer, okay? I don't know how they did it before if they didn't have one just by feel. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're going to keep it above 80, so the bus doesn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, this is right here um, that, hey, state wants money. We are going to give you 50% off your fine if you come and pay us. So... That's for people who maybe they um, failed to appear and stuff like that. Uh, we're going to get 50% back, and they say it's a guaranteed revenue. So if you don't pay your bail, your license does get suspended. So I wouldn't say, hey, I'm just going to hold off on paying my misdemeanor ticket and, because your license will get suspended, but at least you get half off. Um, we, they're allowed to expand it. What violations that you could be uh, going infractions to into misdemeanors? Before it was an infraction, they could do the program. Hey, you did speeding. It was four hundred bucks. Come in, give us two hundred bucks, and we'll, we'll clear. We'll, we'll give you your license back. But you can't do reckless driving DUI, and uh, you can't do it for parking tickets. That you just have to sell your car for, I guess. And that's all of our, our pretty much our new updates. Um, does anybody have any questions? It doesn't have to be about this. It can be about other ones. Yes, a dog. But any other animal is not the same? Well, because dogs are domesticated. I mean, if you were to hit a raccoon. Or what about a rat? What about a cat? No. Because they they have like the feral the, yeah it's I think it's specific for dogs and if you hit a dog and leave and don't stop it's hit and run yeah because that's deemed someone's property yeah where a cat is just whoever's feeding it, it belongs to them right they they could just walk over to someone else and become their but, call call yeah I guess you have to call nine one one and say hey I hit a dog really yes. Yeah, it's it's domestic. It's because it's domesticated. Oh, you don't call the. But you know, like if you hit a cow or something like that, you'd also call. Um, but other like a coyote or a fox, you wouldn't have to. And that's been around for uh, you know a long time. I, I don't know when it the inception was. You get a ticket for that, or? Well, you could get charged with hit and run. I have, I don't think I've. But if you call it in. You no, you call it in and say. I don't think they're going to take you to jail for hitting a dog, honestly. Usually when you hit a dog, it's not your fault. The dog's like yeah, a dog ran out in front of you and you hit it, so you might as well call. And, I mean, maybe it damaged your vehicle because, I mean, a 50, 60-pound dog can break your car and you want to ha let us at least try to find the owner so that, you know, you can get some type of money back. Did you want to show anything?